Good morning. Morning. Nice to see everyone this morning. I'd like to begin with an article from uh, the daily devotional that's put out on the internet by the Wesleyan Church, and it's entitled The Soil Within Us. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Isaiah 61 11. And the person writing this says, I kill plants. Despite my best efforts, plants are far more likely to meet their demise than they are to thrive under my care. A few months ago, my husband and I were in the city and ended up on a lift with a lady who was carrying the largest, most beautiful hanging plant I had ever seen. I commented on the gorgeous plant, and when she got off the lift, we both noticed that a small sprig had broken off and landed on the ground. She jokingly told me to take it home and repot the small shoot. My husband and I both laughed, knowing full well that under my care it would be doomed but I picked up the small vine anyway. I convinced my husband to stop by the hardware shop on the way home so that I could purchase a small flower pot and a bag of soil. I carefully replanted my little sprig, and over several months, with lots of care and proper attention, that small shoot has grown into a vine that is now thriving. The same is true of the soil of our hearts. When we allow the Lord to cultivate His Word and His presence within us, we begin to grow and thrive. We experience His righteousness, and our lives sing the praises of the one true God. Allow God to cultivate the soil of your heart for His glory. Let's just pray as we begin the service this morning. Heavenly Father, I just pray this morning that as we come together in your name, that we would allow you to plant the seed of your word in our hearts, and that we would do what we need to do to see that it's nourished and watered and, and thriving, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would grow your precious word in our hearts and give us your wisdom and your guidance that that seed of your word would grow and multiply in our lives and in helping others, Lord. We pray, Lord, that today, uh, whatever our experiences have been through this past week, whatever concerns we have in our hearts, that we would come to you and, and lay those things at your feet and ask for your answer to those needs, your hand upon those concerns in our heart. And Lord, as we come together, help us to focus our hearts and minds on you and to trust you with everything in our lives. Help us, Lord, today as we further look at those people in your word that we have examples of who lived holy lives, blessed lives. Help us to learn from these men and women, Lord, in the Bible, how you can help us to be people who bring glory to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 11, 9, 24. Now, those who have been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia. 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 Cyrus and Antioch tells the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greek also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and as they sent Barnabas to Antioch, when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad 
encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of Holy Spirit it and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. May the Lord bless this reading. We have been having a series of sermons called Holiness with Skin On. This is the second sermon in that series. I want to speak to you today about a sanctified life. Bibles. What does being sanctified look like? Uh, we look at the life of Barnabas and we shall see. Barnabas was the nickname given by the apostles to a Christian man from the island of Cyprus. His original birth name was Joseph and he was a Levite. <coughs> a Levite is a synagogue assistant. In our context, <coughs> a Levite is similar to, a, like in our church, a, a board member or in some churches a deacon, similar to that. So he was a Levite and he helped in the synagogues. And shortly after Pentecost, the believers in the church in Jerusalem shared the proceeds from the sale of houses and land and gave the proceeds uh, to the poor among the church people. In this joyful setting, we first meet Barnabas. He is described in Acts 11 verse 24 as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and the faith. If you go back to Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37, we find that Barnabas donates funds, his own funds, towards helping the poor. He donates funds from the sale of his land. <coughs> we assume the land was back in Cyprus, where he came from. And it was for meeting the needs of the poor within the Jerusalem church. There was no pressure whatever to sell his property or to give the money for the sale. He gave it because he was a generous man. So this is where we first hear of Barnabas in the, in the book of Acts. <coughs> then if we go over to Acts chapter 9, we find that Barnabas defends Saul. You remember this? Saul was the man who led the persecution against the Christians. He had written authority from the chief priest in Jerusalem to arrest and imprison women and children and men who were Christians. They thought they were pleasing God by doing so. After Saul was converted and God confronted him on the road to Damascus, when the Jews realized that Saul was a genuine Christian now, the Jews plotted to kill him. And the problem was that the Christians didn't trust him either. And so when Saul tried to join the disciples in Jerusalem, they were fearful of him and wary of him, thinking it might have been a trap. And they didn't believe that he was now a genuine disciple of Jesus. So you can understand them being wary. But in Acts 9 verse 27 it says, Barnabas took him, Saul, and brought him to the apostles and told them Saul's testimony of conversion. What a brave and encouraging man Barnabas was. Yes, Barnabas needed God's wisdom to know whether or not Saul was genuine. He also had God's love and encouragement to act upon what God showed him to do. He understood Saul's dilemma and he understood the church's fear of the former leader of the enemy against the church in Acts chapter 8 verse 3. As a result of Barnabas commending Saul to them, he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Now he had freedom of movement because they accepted Barnabas' testimony. Barnabas also declared God's encouragement to the scattered believers. Because of the persecution, they were scattered in many directions. And Barnabas looks them up and encourages them. The great persecution followed from Stephen's martyrdom recorded in Acts chapter 11. The church in Jerusalem sent Barnabas to encourage the believers as far as Antioch, north of Jerusalem, to continue faithfully keeping, to keep following the Lord. But Barnabas was a great encourager. In fact, his name, Barnabas, the nickname they gave him means son of encouragement. 
And then after Saul is accepted by the church in Jerusalem, he goes back to his home country in Tarsus. And he'd been there for quite a few years, and it seemed like everybody had forgotten about Saul. Do you know what Barnabas does? He goes looking for him. He went to his hometown, travelled a great distance from Antioch to Tarsus in Cilicia, which is modern Turkey, where Paul was, where Paul was from, it was at least 200 kilometres away. And Saul had been active in his hometown perhaps for 14 years before coming back to Antioch. Barnabas brought Saul back to Antioch to help the church there to teach and to reach a great many people of that city. So here's Barnabas again, looking up Saul, bringing him back from his hometown and bringing him back to where <coughs> things were happening in Antioch. And then we see Barnabas and Paul are asked to deliver a donation from the church in Antioch to the people in Jerusalem because there was great poverty and, and uh, famine in that area. So Barnabas and Paul were asked by the church in Antioch to deliver donations for drought victims in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 11, verse 27 to 30. As a result of the great drought prophesied by Agabus, one of the prophets, the disciples in Antioch determined to send drought relief to their Christian brothers living in Judea. Doesn't it sound a bit like our day, drought relief? It's happened before. Each one was to give according to his own ability. The Antioch, Antioch church entrusted the funds to be delivered by Barnabas and Paul to the elders of the church of Jerusalem. They didn't, they didn't have electronic bank transfers in those days. If you want to transfer funds, it had to physically be delivered in a bag. And they trusted them to deliver. And then the church at Antioch, sometime later, recorded in Acts chapter 13. The church commissioned them as the story we had today to send the gospel to the Gentiles. Because in Antioch, there were a lot of Greeks in that city many of them became Christians and so they wanted the, the Gentiles and non-Jews also to hear the gospel in other parts of the world. So the church commissioned Barnabas and Saul, they were the very first Christian missionaries from Antioch to travel around the Mediterranean and spread the gospel. First of all they went to Cyprus which was Barnabas's home country then they went to Perga, and here John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, who was their assistant with them, quit and went back to Jerusalem. The next stop was at another place called Antioch, a different Antioch in Pisidia. Then on to Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. These are all places in the Mediterranean. Now on their homeward journey, they went back to these cities. On their return journey, they went back to these cities to strengthen the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. So Paul didn't just plant the church and leave it. On his return trip, he went back to those same places and, and set up leadership and encouraged them in the Lord. And in Acts 4 and verse 22, it says they exhorted them or encouraged them to continue in the faith. And to, they appointed elders in every church and prayed with them and commended them to the Lord. Now in those days, there were no telephones, there were no <coughs> newspapers. They had to do the encouragement in person themselves. Then they sailed back to Antioch where they started. Having completed the mission, the first mission journey, they were sent on. And they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. In Acts 14 verse 27. They had completed the very first missionary journey. In Acts chapter 13 verse 9, it tells us that Saul was also known as Paul. When Paul became, after Paul became a Christian, his name was changed from Saul to Paul. But on the way, Barnabas and Paul, even though they'd worked well together, they had a disagreement. In Acts 15 verse 36 to 41, 
Paul, Barnabas and Paul decided to make a follow-up visit to all the new churches where they had gone on the first journey. But they could not agree on the makeup of the team to go with them. So on their second missionary journey, they were talking about who's going to go with them in the team. could not agree on the makeup of the team, and Barnabas was determined to take his cousin, John Mark, with him. But Paul would not accept John Mark because he had quit partway in, in the previous journey. Their contention was so sharp that they separated into two groups, so they had two missionary teams. Barnabas took John Mark and Paul took Silas, and the Christian brothers at the Antioch church commended them to the grace of God. Barnabas was people orientated and I was willing to give the young fellow another go. Paul said he's failed, he quit. No, nope. sorry. God used both of them. In this case, Barnabas, I believe, was right. But God used the disagreement to make two missions instead of one. The interesting thing is that later on, years later, in prison, when Paul was in prison for the gospel, he finally realizes that John Mark was useful as a co-worker in the gospel. You can find that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, and Colossians 4, verse 10, and Philemon chapter 24. Paul realized that the simple goodness of his companion Barnabas had salvaged a young man for the ministry, and Paul would have lost. If they had left John Mark behind, he could have been lost in the ministry. Bless his heart, Barnabas stuck by him. So in conclusion, what can we learn from Barnabas? As the scripture says in Acts 11 verse 24, a good man, he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. His life shows that he lived a sanctified life. For example, he was generous as a donor to the poor. He defended Saul to the church in Jerusalem when they were wary of him with good cause. He declared God's encouragement to the new Gentile believers. He departed to find Saul in his hometown to he help the church grow in Antioch and bring him back to help them. He delivered donations with Saul to the drought victims in Jerusalem. He was dispatched as a missionary with Paul, and he disagreed with Paul over his rejection of John Mark. He was an active and a faithful man of God. Tradition says that Barnabas was one of the 70 in Jerusalem, and that he died later as a martyr in Cyprus. Tertullian, one of the early Christian historians, said that Barnabas authored the book of Hebrews. That is not universally accepted, but that's what Tertullian thought. His sanctified character is what we're talking about today. Barnabas was gracious, generous, and discerning of the potential of new Christians. He was free from petty narrowness and suspicion and an aliveness of heart. He was big hearted. And I pray that God would give us more people like that who live out their sanctified lives. Barnabas wasn't like that just because he, that was his personality. He was like that because he let God sanctify him and he was filled with the Spirit, as the Scripture says. And even with his disagreement with Paul, he stuck with John Mark and God greatly used John Mark and Paul and Silas and Barnabas. And the conclusion I come to is this, our circumstances are different to this, but the same God who wants to sanctify us, if we will let God sanctify our hearts, what can he do with our faithful and obedient lives using prayer? We just get them to it. The question I want to leave you with 
today is will you let God sanctify your soul and make you his true servant? Because God worked through Barnabas to greatly bless the church. He helped many lives follow Jesus because he did. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for the scripture record of the life of Barnabas. It shows what it's like, Lord, to be a sanctified man in the world in which he lived. And Lord, we need to be sanctified Christians right where we live, in Serena and Mekhi. Help us, Lord, to surrender our all to you so that you can fill our hearts with your spirit, to be the kind of godly people you want us to be. So Lord Jesus, we pray that you'll come into our hearts in your fullness and fill us with your spirit. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing in closing.